back to the Get Your Life Back Online Summit. I'm Beth Genley, your host, and today we are welcoming Damon Cart, an NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming Master Practitioner. Damon Cart's passion is guiding people through transformation to achieve joy, fulfillment, passion, and greater personal and career performance, which is why I was so excited to talk to you today, Damon. Welcome to the summit. Thank you. And I understand you're going to talk about motivation today. Let's hear what you, what, how you see that linking into our topic. Well, it's probably the thing that most people come to me for coaching. And so it's obviously something that people are struggling with. And what I've noticed with my clients and just listening in general to the way that people talk about motivation is they treat it like it's a thing, like it's an object that you can pick up and put in your pocket and take with you somewhere. You either have it or you don't have it. And that's not really how motivation works. And the truth is, is that you're, you never lose your motivation. The only thing that can really happen is you may stop believing in the strategy that you're using to go after what it is that you want. And then you can have some other limiting beliefs as, you know, do you deserve it? Some people struggle with uh, limiting beliefs of whether or not they deserve what they want. So you have these obstacles that can be internal or external. And if they get in the way, a person might stop believing that they're either capable or that they deserve what they want. And that can come out as as a feeling of losing motivation. But the truth is you're always motivated to go after what you want. It's like saying, how do you not want what you want? You're always going to want what you want. And if you were given a clear pathway to what you want, nothing would stop you. You know, if you're, if you're hungry and I put your favorite dish in front of you, you don't stop to ask whether or not you're motivated. You know, am I motivated to eat this? No, you just do it. So, Motivation is natural. It's always there. You're always motivated to get what you want. The only thing that stops you is possible internal limitations. There may be external limitations, but as long as we believe that we deserve what we want and that we are capable, we're, we're going to move past those limitations. I would love to hear you go a little deeper into that because I remember when I got really burned out, I didn't want to it felt like I didn't want anything anymore. I just wanted them to stop bothering me. I, I, did, I lost caring about a lot of things that I had cared about before. So if I were your client, how would you address that with me? Well, we'd have to get more details from that, but just from hearing what you're saying, it sounds like a hopelessness or a helplessness, or coming from a place of hopelessness or helplessness. Bingo. <laughs> and that comes from a limiting belief about deservingness, about whether or not you can. So it goes back to that. So we, we sometimes reach that point in our life because we're not sure what else to do. And it feels like everything we've done didn't work and that there, we're hopeless or helpless to make it work. Now, the other possibility, and this happens a lot, especially when I'm coaching people who are in and around midlife, a lot of what they're struggling with a lot of times is coming to terms with having spent an entire life chasing values that weren't their own. Mm -hmm. it, they were given to them by their parents. They were given to them by their culture, by their society. There are so many doctors and lawyers out there who did not want to become doctors and lawyers, but they couldn't think of doing anything different because they might disappoint their parents. So because they had that opportunity, they became that. And sure, they may be successful, they may have the money that their parents wanted them to have and the security that their parents wanted them to have, but they're not happy. And the reason they're not happy is because they, they didn't fulfill their own values or fulfilling their parents' values. And there's nothing wrong with making your parents happy. You know, I, I, I love it when my parents are quite pleased with me, but I, the best that I can do for everyone around me, myself included, is to pursue my values and uh, to fulfill them. Because when I do that, not only am I happier, but also my self-esteem and confidence goes up. And that's how self-esteem and confidence is actually created. When you do something, when you behave in a way that aligns with your values, your self-esteem and confidence goes up. Also, your energy levels go up. Now, the opposite of that is what we're talking about with burnout. If you're pursuing or you're behaving in a way that 
does not align with your values, your self-esteem is going to go down, your confidence is going to go down, your energy levels are going to go down. I'll give you an example. So if I value kindness and I behave in ways that are kind, and, and, and so I might have my own personal criteria of what's kind, everybody does. So if I'm behaving in what I consider a kind way and I value kindness, I feel better about myself, which makes me feel happier, which gives me energy. I have more confidence. I feel good about me. If I value kindness and I behave in a way that is cruel or that I think is cruel, my self-esteem goes down, my confidence goes, goes down, my energy levels go down, I think of myself as a bad person, like all these things start piling on top of me. So anytime you align with your values, you're, you're going to have more energy, you're going to feel more motivated, you're going to feel better about yourself. But here's the thing, what happens if you don't really know what your values are? And it's amazing to me how often I coach people who really have no clue what their values are. And they are context specific. Your values in the, in the realm of your professional life versus your values in your family life are likely to be different. Now, we tend to also have values that are very, very general, very broad for our entire life. And so there, there are those. Those are, those are actually harder to get to. Those are harder to elicit. It's much easier to elicit values in a, in a particular context. But the more you elicit your values in smaller contexts, the more you will start to understand and become aware of your overall general values for your life. Okay, I, I, I'd like to pursue this just a little bit more because I think that one thing, a version of value, which really threw me and I think throws a lot of people, in my case, it was the patient always comes first. And I think in corporate settings, it probably comes out as the customer is always right. Mm -hmm. And I, I found myself absolutely flipped with that. And to me, it was a kindness value. It was a, it was a social justice value. So I'd love to hear kind of your take on that. Well, to be honest, I, <laughs> I was a bartender for 10 years and um, I, and I've, I have two businesses and I, I don't believe the customer is always right in the sense that the customer should always get what they want because if the customer always gets what they want, but it's not also a good relationship and what we call ecological, meaning it doesn't balance the system and a good balanced ecological system means you have all the components getting what they need or what they want and you have a balanced system. Well, if I'm, if the customer is always right and I'm just uh, lowering my prices or, you know, I'm not making a profit, but the cust I'm just only focused on making the customer happy, well, I'm going to go out of business and I'm not going to be able to give that service to the customer anymore. So you got to be careful about these sort of blanket values or the blanket strategies. So the customer is always right. Is You're right. It's not actually a value. The value behind it may be kindness, but the strategy can get you into trouble. So what I think the customer is always right is mainly a strategy about making a good business and, and, and being better than your competition. So you're serving your customer as best that, the best that you can. And um, that's, that's a great value to be in service to your customer. But overall, what you're looking to do is run a successful business. That's what you value is success of the business. And it's great to do it in a way where you're really serving your customers. If you're really serving your customers, they're happy, they're giving you more business, therefore you're happy, everybody's happy. But if, you're, if the customer's always right, runs you into the ground, makes you unhappy, makes you unsuccessful, well, then the value is not being fulfilled. So it sounds to me as if one of the basic questions when you're, when you're stuck like that, I, I'm, I think I'm trying to live out my values, but I, I feel terrible. This is, I'm not getting what I want. One of the questions it sounds like you ask is, is this a strategy or is it a value and are we confusing the two? That's a, yeah, that's a, you're, you caught on really quick. <laughs> great, great. Because that's a lot of times what it is. It's, it's when you find out what the value is and you let people, it helps people to detach from the means to get to that value. And once you can elicit the value, what somebody's really after, this happens a lot when I'm dealing with people when it comes to money. Because they're so focused on the money, which is the result. And, and I, what, I, what I do is I, I tell them, you know, 
what would what good would this green paper do if you were stranded on an island? It, nothing. The value is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's no inherent value to money. Money is you believe that having money will give you a certain experience. So let's talk about what that experience is first, and then let's revisit the strategy and see, because whatever strategy you're using now is not working. And what happens is it's a strange thing. When you're able to understand what experience you're projecting onto an object, say money, what you realize is that if you're projecting that, inevitably, if you can project that, you, it must be coming from you. So if you're projecting a certain value onto money, whatever experience it is, when you become aware of what that experience is, like it may be security, it may be freedom, and realizing it's coming from me, well, the only way I can know what freedom and security are enough to project it means it must be emanating from me. So what I do is I coach people to reconnect with that resource within themselves. And when they do that, the funny thing is, is a lot of times they end up getting the result that they want, which is more money. Because if I feel successful, if I feel secure, if I feel free, then I can attract money more easily to me. I might take certain risks that I wasn't going to take before. I might do other things that I hadn't thought of before because I feel free and I feel secure to do that. And with that comes abundance. I'm really glad you brought up money as an example because one of the top reasons that people say they feel stress in the United States and maybe elsewhere is debt. That being, being, having more month than money. <laughs> and, and I, and so get, <clears throat> getting from, I'm, I'm buried in debt and it's making me miserable to I need money and backing out of that to what do I really want? It's kind of what's the pathway you would take into that? I know it's person dependent, but yeah. you no. Know, how do you? If I'm trying to apply some of these principles, how do you recommend that I go about thinking about it? That's yeah. what I'm trying to ask. Well, everybody's going to have, like you said, uh, their own path. And I, I do want to say too, you said it's the number one stress. It's also the number one reason why couples break up, married couples break up, and it, so it's a real, it's a real issue. What I've always done, and I've had my struggles with money in the past, and. What I, what, I'll, what I tell people is, depending on how worked up they are, like if, if a person really sounds hopeless and helpless, like they're really bringing that out, they're really putting a lot of that hopeless, helpless, uh, helplessness and hopelessness out there. I mean, if you're still breathing, you're, you're at least okay. Like in the moment, you're okay. If you have a roof over your head, over your head and you're not starving, and some people are, so I don't want to, like it's not like no, this is you know not happening. It is happening, but in general, in this country, if I'm coaching someone, that's probably not happening. So we start with where the person is, and I, I really work with helping them get grounded. Okay, so you're you have a roof over your head, you're not starving, you're breathing, you're not sick, you have your health at least. So we start there, and from there, you have the potential to do so many things with when you just simply have that. And from there, I would then elicit their values, which when a person, when I elicit a person's values, they have to connect with them. And they may have been disconnected with them. If they're really miserable, if they're feeling helpless and hopeless, that, that's an indication they're not connecting with their values. But just by me asking the questions that leads them down the path of reconnecting with their values, they're going to start to feel motivated again. They're gonna to start to feel energized again. And then we start, start talking about what are some actual behaviors that you can do that align with your values that you can do right now. Instead of like setting some goal down, you know, way down uh, your timeline that may or may not be attainable, let's, let's first start with what can you do today, right now, that will get you, will fulfill your values. And for a lot of people, when they're feeling broke and miserable, one of the things that I'll tell them, to, tell them to do is go give something away. And it doesn't have to be money, but your time. Go give your time or, or go help someone. And what that does is it puts them back in the position of feeling like they have something of value and worth to give to someone else. And when you're in that position, where instead of being in a position of being empty, 
and waiting for someone else to help you or give you something, it completely changes the dynamic. And you realize, wait a minute, I am a person of value. I do have something to give. I have value and worth to give to the world. And so it completely changes the, their position and puts them in a, in a better position to be in to then pursue what it, is, what it is they want. Great. Okay, so let's say that I have achieved some sense of having, having something that I can still give that's congruent with my own values. How do I stay in this space? How do I stay motivated is kind of what I'm asking. I forgot how this came about, but I was at a training and the person who was doing the training, it was a hypnosis training and he had studied the keto for years. And he was, he recalled a story to me, uh, Ose, Osensei, and I haven't studied uh, Aikido, so uh, I'm just going by secondhand information. Uh, Osensei was the man who created Aikido, and at the end of one of their, I guess, days of training, one of the students asked him and said, Osensei, you never seem to lose your center, and your center in Aikido is your center of gravity, your balance. And of course, we have that in life. We have our sense of being centered, which I think is what you're referring to here, where how do you stay in that space? And he said, it's not that I don't lose my center, it's just that I get it back before you do. <laughs> so I think the key to it is, is not staying in the space, it's if you pop out of it, and getting back in. How quickly can you get back into the space? Because we're not perfect, we're going to fall out of that space and instead of getting upset with ourselves and coming down on ourselves and saying, oh, how could we do that? How do I fix this and never let it happen again? Why don't we just get back into the space? Why don't we focus on how to get back into the space rather than uh, being concerned about popping out of it as so much? I mean, and I think it gets easier the, the more that you do it. But we're all going, going to have those days or those moments where we do fall out of the space. I mean, I'm we're talking about motivation and I know I'm in some regard put here as a as an expert on it i certainly have those days where I'm, i don't feel motivated where i don't want to get out of bed or uh, there's something i know i need to do but i don't feel like doing it so it's it, we're all going to experience that nobody's perfect it's how quickly can you get yourself back into that space and a, and a, and a great way to do that is just to remember well what's important to you and it's a quick way to reconnect with that beautiful all right i'm i'm loving this and anything else you want to say about this whole question of motivation and getting into it? It sounds like your your basic thing is finding out what you really want, what your your core values are. It is the absolute most important question you can ask yourself. And for years, I went down this philosophical path of who am I, what am I, and that led me really to nowhere. I don't think life is about arriving somewhere. I don't think life is about reaching ultimate fulfillment where you're done and you don't have to do anything else. I think life is ongoing. It's living, it's breathing, it's about engaging. And when you're really clear about what your values are, what you're going to find is you're going to achieve goals, but you're not gonna put so much emphasis on the goal because how many times do we achieve goals where we're, we celebrate for 24 hours and then we kind of shrug our shoulders and go, okay, well, what do I do now? I would have to set another goal and now I'm not gonna be happy until I reach that other goal. That is being overly focused on the result. There's nothing wrong with results. What's more important is to, be, to understand what is the experience that you wanna have. So, okay, you want something. You wanna make six figures a year. You want to get married and have kids. You want uh, to be a CEO. Okay, great. Go deeper than that. What is the experience you want to fulfill? What's the experience you want to have? And it's very important to start with context. Start with the smaller chunks first. And then what you'll become more and more clear about is what is the overall life experience that you want to have? And it is the pursuit of that and being aligned with that that then creates that life. I think a lot of people are looking to buy that thing off the shelf and say, okay, got it done, I'm there. And this is the reason why when I teach NLP, I don't, I actually don't, uh, I don't do certification programs because they're quite meaningless and um, 
it's, it's more marketing than anything else. It's, it's putting in, in the student's head this idea that I can go buy NLP skills off of a shelf, and I've got it, and then I'm done. No, NLP is a lifelong practice like anything else. I also practice yoga. I have been practicing it for 10 years. So at what point do I say, okay, I've got it, and I'm done, and I get to be I'll have all the benefits of yoga for the rest of my life without practicing it. Never. That will never happen. I need to practice yoga on a regular basis to receive the benefits. I can't sit around and watch yoga videos and expect uh, to become more flexible, more balanced, and strong. So it is, it's that engagement. It's that pursuit of your values. And also the recognition that I'm, I embody those values. If I am able to project it, then it's coming from within. But it, it also needs that engagement. It needs that behavior that is aligned with the value at the same time. So I can sit around, and this is what drives me crazy about the law of attraction and, and that sort of thing. And I'm not against it. I just think there's a lot of missing pieces to that. This idea that I can just think it and then I can then, you know, sit for hours in front of a television and not do anything. And, but because I have this vision in my mind about what I want, it's going to arrive, it's going to arrive at my doorstep. No. And even if it did, you wouldn't be happy about it. I mean, you'd be happy maybe for a few hours. But what makes you happy is that engagement, that behavior that you engage in that aligns with your values, and that puts you in that state of flow. And that's what everybody kind of, well, that's what we're all looking for, right, is that state of flow where we sort of forget ourselves and we're just fully engaged in something we really enjoy. Life can be that fully engaged and, and, and just enjoying life. And then you will pop out of the flow. It's, it's going to happen. It's just how, how fast can you get back into it? Uh, that's, I'd like to chase this one more step because you, you named some values that yoga has for you, flexibility, strength, and balance. Hmm. And uh, in my experience of yoga, there are days when I walk out of class thinking I didn't well, you know, or at least in, in the moment, I think, boy, I can't stretch very far. I'm not very strong. Other people are able to do more. Uh, I'm not aligned with my own values in that way. But what you backed it up to is what experience do I want to have? And I really am interested in the relationship a little bit more between experience and values. Well, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. Experience is. Uh... Maybe we could look at it as you could have, you could be experiencing multiple values at one time. And that is ultimately the experience is what the, what is fulfilling those values creates for you. Now, the one, the one way to really kill that very quickly is to compare yourself to others. Mm. So if you're, if you're practicing yoga and you're looking at someone else and you're saying, gee, I'm not as flexible as they are. I'm not as strong as they are. I'm not as balanced as they are you have just detached yourself from your values and you made what someone else is doing more important and you're comparing yourself to that. So now you've created uh, this illusion of you having less value than that person, at least in that context. But I think a lot of us do that overall. We look at people, we look at status. I mean, that's what status is built on. We look mm -hmm. at status and we say, oh, that person makes more money. They're of more value or they know something that I don't or they have something figured out that I don't. And if you're coming from that place, you're always going to be playing this game of you're better than some people and you're worse than others. And that's just never going to serve you. So that takes you out of the experience. That takes you out of the engagement with your values. Now, it can be useful to say, okay, you know, I, I, can, I can run a five-minute mile and I have a friend who can run a four-minute mile. So if they can do it, that makes me feel like I can do it too. Now that kind of comparison can actually help you a little bit, but when you engage in this idea of they have more value than I do, which a lot of that's, I think the majority of what comparing yourself to others is, is come is that's the place where it's coming from. It's, it's certainly going to disconnect you from your values, your, the, the kind of experience you want to have in life. So your free gift that you're offering our viewers is sensory acuity training. 
And I sort of get how this relates to the whole thing. I'd love for you to unpack that for us. I, I, clearly, it's about experience. Don't yeah, you know, um, that's a technique or that's a, it's a, it's a skill that you cultivate. Uh, and for, there's, a many, there's many reasons why you, you would do that or cultivate that skill. And uh, as it relates to this, though, it's a little more indirect. But what you will find when you start developing your sensory acuity and your calibration skills, and that's just basically the ability to pick up the non-verbal communication someone is giving you. So as I'm talking to someone, I'm noticing the micro muscle movements in their face. I'm noticing the colors in their face. I'm noticing um, how the colors in their face change. I'm noticing which direction their eyes are, are moving in. And I'm not analyzing it. I'm not like trying to figure it out because that's a, that's a big mistake a lot of people make. If, you, if, you're, if you're looking at someone that way and you're really trying to figure out what they're doing, you're going to break rapport. You're going to break that sense of connection and communication with the person. But if you're absorbing the information, I'm just taking it in. I'm listening to what you're saying, but I'm also taking in all these other things that people don't pay attention to. Unconsciously, the person I'm doing that with is going to, to sense that I'm giving them a lot more attention than most people do. And that'll build rapport rapidly with the person. I mean, in two minutes or less, I can talking to someone and it suddenly feel like we're, we're really connected because I'm looking at them deeper than what most people do. A lot of times you talk or people are talking to each other and they're only thinking about what they're going to say next. This is a way of disconnecting yourself from the person. So when it comes to engaging in life and having the kind of experiences you want, a big part of this is how you communicate and how you relate to people. So if I'm noticing the different shades of colors in a person's face and in their hair and how they hold their head and their posture. I'm, 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 just, I'm just drinking in so much more of the life and information that's being presented in front of me. It will engage me so much more in life and will give me such a richer experience when it, as it comes to uh, connecting with people and communicating with people and relating to people. So in that sense, we're talking more experience by being able to pick up by making your senses more sensitive to these things that most people don't pay attention to. And it's also auditory. How does the person's tonality change? What words do they use? This, this will open up a whole new world for you because you will start to engage with the world around you on a much deeper level. So it's like, uh, well, Milton Erickson, the father of modern hypnosis, uh, NLP was modeled uh, from him, uh, or from his work, a good, a good chunk of it. And when he would get people who were sort of disconnected from life and, and mainly living internally and inside their head, he would give them these random, what seemed like random tasks. And he was very well known for doing this. And his daughter, Milton Erickson's daughter, recounted a story one time when she came home from school and she was only like eight years old. And she noticed one of her father's clients uh, sitting on the lawn, staring at the grass. And so she walks up to him and says, well, you know, what are you doing? And, she's, and he's like, well, I'm not really sure, but your father told me to sit in, on the lawn and notice and count how many different shades of green I can find. And clearly, it, she, she didn't get this as a child, but as she got older, she started to understand. And she actually went to her father after a while and said, you know, why didn't you give me exercises like that? And he said, well, I didn't have to. You already were engaged in life. You already were connecting with life. And some people aren't doing that. So when you go out in the world and you start noticing these details that you didn't notice before, you will, you will start to have a different experience of life. And uh, one that's just. I'm wondering if having a different experience of life makes it easier for you, for you to figure out what kinds of experiences you want to have. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, the, all right. Yeah. The more you're connected with that, the more you're engaged with that. The thing is, is, you know, I can think back at a, at, so many pursuits that I chased. And then, and a lot of times I actually did get what I wanted. And then when I got it, I moved on. And I looked at, at first I thought, well, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just enjoy what I've gotten? And now that I understand what I understand now about values, it's, it never was the thing. It never was the result. It was the pursuit and getting it. And then what did I learn from it? And then now what do I want now? So, you can get caught up in this idea of, I get what I want and I'm not satisfied, so I keep chasing, I keep chasing. 
or you can step you can step back and realize it's not about getting what you want so much as in the, the result or the object it is the experience that you want and you couldn't have that experience without going through that whole process which is called the hero's journey of pursuing something and learning and having setbacks and obstacles to overcome and it's just that whole process that this is our nature this is what we do and we're creating that experience from, the, from start to finish every time so it's about the experience not necessarily about the result but along the way you do get some wonderful things and you may make a lot of money and you may um, you know, find that perfect person for you and, and have the family life that you want and have all the material stuff that you want. But if you don't, it's not that big of a deal because you're, you're having the life experience that you want and you'll realize that that's far greater, far richer than material. That sounds like a really wonderful place to end as a, as a vision for how your life can be when you, when you focus on experiences and, and deep value. Thank you, Damon. You're welcome. Appreciate it very much. Here.